thank you for coming. Uh, and thank you, Barbara, for the invitation. I, it, it's always a great pleasure to talk about Vatican II, uh, who's one of my heroes, uh, or heroes of the Catholic Church generally, because Yves Congar was the most important theologian of the Second Vatican Council. As you know, Vatican II, which was announced in 1959 and was celebrated in Rome between 1962 and 1965, changed a great deal of things in the Catholic Church and the role of theologians that were supporting the work of the bishops who were the voting members was crucial. And especially work of theologians like Congar who were persecuted by the Catholic Church and silenced uh, Congar, uh, Rahner, uh, De Lubac, uh, Daniel Lu. Okay, but Congar has a specificity because he was involved in a great number of conciliar commissions. Uh, the, the, those groups of bishops and theologians that were doing the work of drafting text. And so Congar was the busiest of all experts because he was member of or consultor of many commissions. And one of the many commissions he worked in was the commission for the text that we know as Nostra Etate, the, the declaration uh, on the relationship between the church and non-Christian religions. And this is interesting because Congar was no expert of interreligious dialogue. He was an expert of ecumenism, uh, but not really uh, on Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism, and not even on Judaism, which is the interesting thing that I've discovered myself in, in, uh, in preparing the lecture of, of, of today, how a theologian who was not an expert at all in Jewish-Christian dialogue made a contribution as a non-expert in a way that was deeply conciliar, deeply faithful to the Second Vatican Council, and which I think has a lot of value for all of us, whether we are uh, faculty, students, administrators, for how to, th th to think about th 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 theological issues, religious issues today as experts or non-experts. So here, let's start with Nostra Aetate. So Nostra Aetate is the shortest document of the Second Vatican Council, just five paragraphs, uh, is the most concise, the most dense of all 16 final documents of the Second Vatican Council, and is the one that has produced most uh, fruit because from those two, three pages of the final document, a, a, a very important history of interreligious dialogue uh, has happened after Vatican II, especially between Christianity, the Catholic Church, and Judaism. This is one of the big differences that the Second Vatican Council made, because if you look at how Christians and also Catholics were talking about Jews or, thinking, or teaching about Jews until the 1950s, early 60s, it was uh, very, very uh, different from the way Catholics started to talk about Jews after Vatican II. So here it's the so-called the teaching on, of contempt that Catholics were used to when they were thinking or talking or writing about the, the Jews. So here there is this distinction that is between anti-Semitism, which is racial, it's a racial issue, a, a difference in, in what people saw in a different ethnicity, blood, and anti-Judaism. And so here Catholics were not usually part of the anti-Semitic movement, or some of them, but that was not really representative of the official position of the Catholic Church, what was representative was anti-Jewish teaching. And so Jews were accused of their side, of having killed Jesus, and that meant that whatever Jews were going through in persecutions, 
in tragedies and so on, it, it was somehow deserved because they had, had called upon themselves the wrath of God and the punishment. Okay? So that was the teaching of the, of the, of the Catholic Church in different forms of languages, different ways, until the Second Vatican Council. That was not unique to Catholics, but of course Catholicism had a special problem, especially in the 20th century, because Catholicism is an exceptional form of, 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 of Christianity, because there's a Pope, there's a Vatican. And of course, World War II, who did the Holocaust, put the Vatican and the Catholic Church under a particular kind of scrutiny, which was different from the way Protestants were accused of being part of the German anti-Semitic Nazi movement. Okay, Catholicism had and still has that specificity. So here, between the end of World War II and the calling of the Second Vatican Council in 1959 by Pope John the 23rd, at the official level, Catholicism doesn't say much on the Holocaust and on, and, and on Jews. There are small groups, circles uh, of movements in Europe, in North America, that try to understand what the Holocaust meant for Catholic uh, theology, for, 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 for the Catholic religion. But that was something that only some, only some specialists w were doing. And Congar was not one of them. And so there are st some proposals uh, of changing prayers, of changing the catechism, but this is still very much underground, unofficial, and some, in some sense tolerated by the official Catholic Church. Everything changes when Vatican II is announced, even though at the announcement of the council and in the very first few months of the preparation, the issues regarding the Jews were not there. The Deus Deus, the official uh, Latin formulation, was not really part of the original agenda. Why? Because, also because of the issue of the state of Israel, that in 1948 becomes the, the Jewish state and the Vatican is disturbed by this because they see something that changes the historical political position of Jews in the world. A dispersed nation, a nation in diaspora now having their own state. And so the Vatican officially reacts with well, this is a state, but we don't acknowledge that. This lasts for a long time, even after the Second Vatican Council. So, early on, there is a reluctance of the Catholic Church official institutionally to deal not just with what the Holocaust was, but also with the, the creation of the state of, of Israel, not only for, for theological reasons, but also for... Uh, issues of safety of Catholics in the Middle East, because all Catholics in the Middle East were living in Arab states at war with Israel. And so this is a continuing issue until today, basically. Whenever the Pope or bishops talk about the state of Israel, they always consider what will my statements mean for Catholics and Christians living in Israel, in the Palestinian lands, in Egypt, in Syria, Jordan, that's, it's always like that. But that changes very quickly in 1960 because of um, a couple of events, but especially one. On June 13th, 1960, uh, John the 23rd meets with a Jewish historian, a French, Jules Isaac, who was very famous in France for writing textbooks for high schools, I mean history textbooks for, for high school, but he was Jewish, and during the, the Vichy regime, 
he his whole family had had been sent to to the camps and and he was the only survivor together with his male son and he has this audience uh, that is is arranged in a very complicated way because the Secretariat of State of the Vatican didn't want a French Jew to meet with the Pope. There is a series of obstacles that they try desperately to put and avoid this audience because maybe they knew what was going to happen. And so Julie Zach, in the end of this audience, asked Pope John, do we Jew, Jews have a hope from the Second Vatican Council? And Pope John famously replied, this is in, 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 in the diary of Julie Zach, said, you are entitled to much more than hope. And at that moment, Pope John starts to tell the top officials of the Second Vatican Council, on the agenda of the council, there has to be a discussion on the relations between the church and the Jews. And so this is a, a pivotal moment in the history of the entire council, not just for the Jews or, or Nostetate, because the addition of the issue de Judeis to the agenda of the council meant also give a particularly important portfolio to a newly created commission within Vatican II, the Secretariat for Christian Unity, which were the underdog, the no ones, they, they didn't have uh, an office, a phone number, they were no ones. But they are given this, and this secretariat is chaired by a German Jesuit biblical scholar, Augustine Bea, who had also been the confessor of Pope Pius XII. And so Bea, uh, as a biblical scholar, as a Jesuit, and as a German, he has a special responsibility. And so the Secretariat will be the engine of this reflection on what Vatican II should say on the Jews. Because that is the most important question this document on the other legions starts with. Because in the history of the Second Vatican Council, there is for three years, the discussion, can we say something on, on the Jews? Yes, no. Who can say that? The Secretariat, the Holy Office. What can we say and what can we leave out? Uh, so these are the questions. But the biggest question is, will this declaration on the Jews survive? Because non setate, is the shortest document of the Second Vatican Council, but it's also the survivor, because there had been several attempts during the entire Council, preparation, celebration, 1960, 62, 66, 64, 65, to eliminate that document from the agenda. At several points, all the experts say, well, we're done. It's impossible to have this document because Israel wants something for us, the Arab states want something else from us, it's an impossible situation. So this is a survivor, really, this document. All the other religions are added towards the end of the, of the drafting history of, of Nostetate, and the most remarkable addition is Islam, or well, actually Muslims, because Islam is not mentioned for some very precise reasons in Nostetate, because Muslims were the ones that Vatican II really was psychologically reluctant to talk, talk about. And, and this is one of the, li of, of, of the least explored chapters of uh, the history of Nostetate. So here there is a series of crises between 1962 and 65, every time both for external pressure, so there is a whole network of Vatican diplomats that are sent to the Arab states and Turkey 
and the Patriarch of Constantinople to convince all these other observers, outsiders, that this document will be about theology, will be about religion, it will not be a political acknowledgement of the state of Israel, and that we beg you not to take this document as a political statement. So they want to make sure this, and that is the external challenge, but there's also an, an, an internal challenge. If, if you look at the literature that was published in the Vatican, in Rome, in the Catholic world during Vatican II on the issue of, of the Jews, we, you still have some clear examples of Catholic anti-Judaism, if not anti-Semitism. So there are a few incidents of anti-Semitic leaflets that are handed out in St. Peter's Square accusing Jews of conspiracy against the Catholic Church, um, of, um, uh, of undermining the Second Vatican Council. Cardinal Bea, the German Jesuit, is accused of being Jewish himself. So there is a whole internal problem within Catholicism. My hometown in Ferrara, north east of Italy, Luigi Maria Carli was one of the most anti-Semite bishops at the Second Vatican Council, widely known for writing anti-Jewish leaflets and and for, for, and for distributing them. And so this is until 1963. It's not clear when this document, if this document will be published, who will be in charge of that and what this document will be able to say and what kind of issues will not be able to talk about. And this is when Congar comes in, because Congar was not a specialist of interreligious dialogue, but a, as Vatican II unfolds, he emerged as the most important theologian on a range of issues, beginning with ecumenism and as an historian of the Catholic tradition. Uh, so here, Congar's life is interesting because he is, in some sense, uh, the average typical European Catholic who in his entire life never had meaningful experiences of communion, of table, of school with Jews. If you look through his diaries, he's French. He and France goes through World War II, Vichy, as we know, that had, has a big part in the destruction of European Jews. So he's an average French uh, who knows about them, has heard something about them. His parents know Jews, but he's not one of them. And, and there's an interesting interview that he gives after the Vatican II when he's asked, you never published anything on, on Judaism. Why is that? And, and the answer is, is startling. He said, I've never been an anti-Semite, but I'm not Jacques Maritain, who, who was fully engaged, also for, for personal biographical reasons, in learning, studying, publishing about Judaism. And so Congar, in 64, becomes involved in this discussion uh, on Ostetate uh, as, as a non-expert. and But there's something very early on that he understands that he can contribute, uh, which is, a first case is in 1964, when on the floor of the Second Vatican Council, there is uh, the the, the, the distribution of anti-Jewish leaflets, and he formally requests the leaders of the council to issue a formal condemnation of this. And so, to my knowledge, there's no formal condemnation of those writings, 
the result is a, a, a general prohibition of distributing uh, personally published materials on the floor of the Second Vatican Council. So he feels that there's something at Vatican II in the resurgence of the anti-Jewish and, and anti-Semitic Catholic uh, sentiments that he has to counter. And a second instance is when the commission finds itself up against a wall on the issue of the day side. So as I said, day side was the very ancient accusation against Jews of, heavy, of, of being damned in the eyes of God because they killed Jesus Christ. And so at some point, Congar and all of them, they realize that the day side, that inserting in the text the official rejection of the accusation of day side against the Jews would be too powerful for both Middle Eastern Christians and for some sectors of the Catholic Church. So in the end, the decision is that we will make some reference in Nostra Tate against the day side, but the word day side cannot be in there. And so Congar insists we have to say as much as possible against this. So he's very, very adamant on, 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 on this. And it's interesting to know that one of those who were, were against adding day side to the text was the Pope himself, Paul VI, who knew that it, it was dangerous to to reject something that had been for so long part of the Catholic teaching against Jews, 1964. And so here Congar has a measure of, of how complicated this discussion is for a number uh, of, of reasons that have to do also with the, the position of the Pope to, uh, to reject officially the mention of day side. So here, in his diary, here, the, uh, the passages on Nostatate, they intensify between the spring of 1964, the second intercession, and the spring of 1965, the third and final intercession, the, the, those months between two conciliar uh, sessions. And so here there is a short passage from his diary uh, of April 25th, 1964, that I want to uh, read. And, and he's reporting about a meeting with the secretary of the Commission for, for Christian Unity, Johannes Willebrand, this, this Dutch uh, uh, clergy. And he says, uh, according to him, we have to follow these, these criteria to emphasize the link between the Jewish people and the Catholic Church, to avoid all reference to their side, to speak of other non-Christian people as children of God, and to affirm the principle of brotherhood in condemning any slur on a race or a human beings for racial reasons. According to Monsignor Villebrands, there should not be any specific reference to Muslims. All the experts and the missionary bishops say that an attitude like that of Massignon is, in practical terms, contrary to realities. We are at peace with the others everywhere else, except the Muslims who fight against us. This is the French legacy, colonial legacy of French Catholics in the Middle East that still echoes. <laughs> and so, in part, is a civilizational colonial heritage. In part, is also theological because the real ghost here is Louis Massignon, this Christian mystic who fought his entire life 
against this exclusive alliance between Jews and Christians to the exclusion of Muslims. And so they say, we should say these things on the Jews. To say these things on the Jews, we have to add something on Muslims, even if we perceive they are at war with us. But we have to keep very far from Massignon's mystical theology, which was dangerous for Catholics for obvious reasons, but also for Muslims because it was basically a Sufi. Right. So here, Nostetate has to steer between enormous obstacles, icebergs, there are many things were in, in plain sight, but other things were hidden and underwater. So here, um, at the third session, in 1964, we have a resurgence in the aula of St. Peter of anti-Semitism and of anti-Judaism. And at some point, the idea is, let's not have a separate document on the Jews, but let's attach a chapter to the constitution on the Jews, uh, on, 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 on the church, on, on the Declaration, Lumen Gentium, which meant basically do for the Jews the same thing that had been done for the Virgin Mary, chapter 8 of Lumen Gentium, right? So the Lumen Gentium becomes like a train where if there's something you don't know how to put it, okay, Lumen Gentium will take it. Okay. And so, and so Congar is very much against this, and there is uneasiness because they fear that this will water down the, the import of the statement on, on the Jews. One more problem is the growing anxiety of Pope, of Pope Paul VI against making a statement on the Jews that looks really new compared to the past teachings of the, of, of, of the Catholic Church. And here there is, uh, in September 64, there is, uh, in his diary, this, uh, this brief note. The bishops have received in a sealed envelope a statement claiming that Cardinal Bea is of Jewish descent. Anti-Semitism is not dead, end quote. So this is 1964, 20 years after the Holocaust. So they still deal with that. Um, and between 64 and early 65, the destiny of Nostetate is extremely uncertain. At several points, they give up hope. And they say maybe this will be one of, of the issues that will be dealt by the papacy itself after the conclusion of the council. So which was a solution that had been chosen for other issues. For the Jews, that was going to be more difficult. In April 1965, the Pope makes clear his objections. And there is uh, an interesting quote uh, from the diary uh, of April the 3rd, 1965. Quote, at dinner, Josef Ratzinger told me that the declaration on the Jews was thought to be again in question. The Pope, Paul VI, was thought to be convinced of the collective responsibility of the Jewish people in the death of Christ. And that would cause some fresh difficulties." End quote. So here, it's a commission that has no friends, and the only friends they had were outside and were not really in the room, meaning some Jewish experts. And so it's a very dangerous situation. And a moment that gives the title to the talk of, 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 of uh, today, it's a very long page, long, long section 
in, in his diary uh, of May 3rd, 1965, which is almost entirely taken uh, by the question on or the section on uh, on the Jews. Uh, so one problem is what kind of effects the council's statement on the Jews will have um, on on Christians in the Middle East. And so here's first quotation. Monsignor Willebrand has made two trips to Lebanon, Jerusalem, Egypt. He made himself aware of the precise situation. In the East, the Christians, as well as the Jews and the Arabs, and on the, uh, and on the Christian side, the Orthodox, as well as the Catholics, take this declaration in quite a different sense from its true meaning. Between Arabs and Jews, any statement touching the, the Jews falls into a situation of war. That is how they perceive it's a war, as you know, between Israel and the Arab state that continues after 1948 uh, in, with different degrees and, and intensity. But the big fear is that to Christians in the Middle East, Catholics in the Middle East, will happen what had happened to Jews in Middle Eastern countries that after 1948 they had to leave. And so they were basically e e expelled. And so the Vatican, the, the Secretary of, of State, is concerned that this may end up in a widespread persecution of Christians in the Middle East if they perceive the Catholic Church taking the side of the state of, of, of Israel. This is a real concern and it's basically the reason why Nostra Tate never said any, never even tried to say anything on the theological question of the land of Israel. And so Nostatate talks only about the people, Jewish people. He never talks about Israel as a nation and even less as a state, which is, by the way, still one of the, of the, of the problems of the Catholic Church's uh, relationship with Israel today. Um, a second quotation is on the issue uh, of... Uh, the day side. The Pope himself is in favor of the declaration, but is trying to avoid the risks by suppressing the word day side and this section on anti Semitism. In the East, the Christian people and even the clergy do not understand the intention of what is being said about the, the accusation of their side. They're saying all the same who did kill Jesus and wasn't Jesus God? They are impervious to, to distinctions and explanation. So here they know that they have to say that but they cannot quite use that word. And in the end the decision is, is to avoid that word by saying something that conveys that concept. Third quotation is, I believe, the most important to understand Congar's contribution, Nostra Tate, and Vatican II generally. So third quotation, it, 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 towards the end, uh, it, it says, whatever happens, we are in agreement that the odium of simply not promulgating the, the text should not be foisted on the Pope. So he says, we as a council, we have to, to protect the authority of the Pope, in some sense, which this is one of the lost things in the Catholic Church today, <laughs> by the way. So we have to make sure to say something important, and at the same time, not to blame the Pope for not saying enough. And then, uh, the council must accept its responsibilities. 
But several of us insisted that it will have to, uh, to uh, uh, accept this in the full knowledge of the factors involved on the basis of, of the precise documentation and for the real reasons clearly set out. And these reasons will also have to be made known to the public in complete frankness. And this is the core. For myself, however, I am in no way in favor of the pure and simple withdrawal of the text. 20 years after Auschwitz, it's impossible that the council should say nothing. World opinion has been so aroused the Jews are to such a degree on the lookout that it's impossible to conclude in such a feeble fashion. I would be in favor of putting forward a new text that would propose dialogue in terms both strong and generous that would condemn all violence motivated by race or religion with allusion to the massacre of Armenians as well as the Jews that would finally set forth, in dignified terms, some of the points that call for elaboration and which, because of their underdeveloped state, the Council is now sending back to two secretariats for non-Christian religions and to ecumenism. So this is the heart of, 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 of Congar's uh, argument. At the Vatican II, for all questions, all major theological questions, included the Jews, there are fundamentally two ways of making an argument. One way is to look at what the Catholic, the tradition, the sources, can tell us. How we can learn new things by reading sources in a new way. So resource mom. Which is clearly something that for Nostatate is impossible. If you look at the footnotes of Nostatate, it's all scripture. <laughs> and, and, and the tradition, papal teaching, doesn't exist because there was nothing that could be used. Here Congar, and this is Vatican II in general, says this. There are questions that theologically can be addressed only from the perspective of the signs of the times. This is the major testimony uh, of Congar. Because Congar, if you look at his ecclesiology, for example, how he, he frames he, he, his ecclesiology, uh, the Old Testament, Jewish people looks very much preconciliar. He's one of the defenders at Vatican II in the commission of theologians that had a more traditional reading of uh, Romans, uh, ninth chapter, 11th chapter, Galatians, and so on. But one thing that stands out in Congar and this is something that he had in common, of course, with Chenu, is the idea that history should teach us something in terms of acknowledging what happens in the history of our world, acknowledging that, and making theological work on the basis of those events. So, I mean, how can you locate the Holocaust? in the context of the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church. It's very hard to make sense of the Holocaust in light of the Tertullian, of the fathers of, of, of the Church. And so this is Congar's contribution. He's, he's saying, 20 years after Auschwitz, the Council cannot say nothing on Vatican II. He's not a PR concern it is not a communication strategy. And so that it tells me something, for example, when we think about our major crisis in the Catholic Church of today, the sex abuse crisis. Is it possible to still hold the 
Ecclesiology of the Societas Perfecta in light of the Second World Crisis? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> there are signs of our times that tell us uh, a, 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 a few things. So here, Congar could not put a band-aid on the major weaknesses of Nostra Tate in the fourth paragraph on the Jews. First, in Nostra Tate there's no request of forgiveness of the Catholic Church. And so we do that, we understand that because of John Paul II. <laughs> but Nostra Tate says nothing about they never talked about that first. Their side is not there. And so here there is a, a passage that any hatred uh, against is, 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 uh, is, uh, is to be rejected, but the technical term of their side is not there. Israel is not there. Israel as, as a state, but also Israel as a, as a nation, as a people, is not there. The condemnation of anti-Semitism is no longer the original condemns in an earlier draft, but in the final version is deplores. So Nostatata has major weaknesses. There is a theology of Israel that has clear the substitutionist undertones. Okay, because Nostatata 4 says the old Israel is the Israel in the flesh, but the Israel in the spirit is the church, which is something that no Catholic today should say. Right? So here, Congar couldn't do that. What he could do in Nostratate, in this commission, and in all the other, he says, there is a theology of history that is the only way to make sense of the church of Christianity in our modernity in our modern times. And so this is, I, I, I believe, the most important contribution he made because, final thought, because if we accept that, so if we accept that on some issues the best theological resource we have is to start from the idea that there are signs of the times that compel us to read our situation in light of the gospel and not in light of the previous tradition, if you accept that, now the whole question of the interpretation of, the, of, uh, of, uh, of continuity and this continuity in the Catholic Church's teaching, it takes a whole different shape because it's very hard to make a continuity argument for Nostetate. It's very hard because the only continuity there is, is, look at the footnotes, the scripture. There's no continuity possible between Nostetate, I think, and Pope Pius IX or Pope Gregory VII. So here, I believe Congar is still alive because, and I speak as a personal uh, a, a experience, I lived in Italy until 2008. Uh, I, by coming here, I, I discovered as a scholar, as a person, as a member of the, of, the, of, the, of the church, totally new issues compared to my biographical experience. Race, homosexuality, Totally new. The only way I believe that is possible for the Catholic Church to deal with radically new issues, radically new issues, is to take seriously the signs of the times. So here Nostetate concerns a very specific issue, a very tragic history of, of relations between Christians and Jews. But if we accept Nostetate as a way of doing theology, I believe that will help us, despite our anxieties, our confusion sometimes, 
to see a light in doing theology on issues that are new and on which the Catholic tradition has very little, nothing to say, or sometimes things that are, quite frankly, I believe, unusable. There is a way. If Vatican II could say something 20 years after Auschwitz, in the same floor where anti-Semitic pamphlets were distributed, then I believe that we can do something following that example. And Congar, I, I believe, had the most clarity in seeing that modus procedendi, that way of doing theology and of doing teaching of the, of, 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 of the, of, of the church, because Vatican II is not just theology, it's also the tradition. Of the and so this, this, this chapter opens, I believe, interesting possibilities for us. Whatever is our field of research, of study, uh, whatever our confessional uh, or, or religious background is, because in our post-secular or post-post-secular modernity, we are faced every day with issues where there is very little tradition we can build on. But this is not an impossible task, I think. Uh, so there's a way forward. And so I thank you for, the, for this opportunity to think about this, because uh, I have learned myself new, new things. And so we have a few minutes for your questions or comments. Or thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Massimo, I, I forgot before to mention that next week, uh, November 7th through 9th, there will be a conference here on campus on Nostra Aetate that Father Ellis has put together for us. So uh, if you have time, uh, go to some of the sessions. It's online. They'll be over in the, in the Conley Center. People are coming from around the world for, to be presenters for this conference. So you, at least you have a grounding in what to expect right. them to <laughs> say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Yes. Did the Jewish leaders in the U.S. have much input into the they, council? They did, because when Vatican, when in 64, 65, the rumors are that Vatican II will not publish this declaration, there's a huge pushback from the United States. And so this is, on this, and on religious liberty, Vat, Vatican II could not do what they did without the U.S. That was uh, also because of, of, of different biographical experiences of bishops. If I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, one of his sisters was married to uh, a Jewish uh, rabbi or something. It's totally unthinkable for a, 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 an Italian Cardinal. Of course. So that had an, an important uh, part. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. I really enjoyed the, the presentation and you tell, it, uh, tell your story so compellingly. I'm just curious about the relationship between the Vatican II story and the emergence of so-called new political theology in Germany uh, a few years later, right. which also uh, has a self-understanding of being responsive to the Jewish Holocaust, um, but often doesn't, at least in... Uh, so I, I'm curious if uh, the Nets um, tradition is also responsive to what's I think so, but there's a difference. So, German theology at Vatican II is very cautious and very embarrassed. Mm. So there's really no public voice other than Cardinal Bea. Mm. And so German theologians, German bishops at Vatican II do something that speaks about their past, but for example, so the there are two joint declarations of peace with Polish bishops and with French bishops, 63 and 64, but not Jews. And so they are behind this effort, but not... Why? Be because German Catholicism, the official narrative of German Catholicism, bishops, cardinals, and so on, until very recently, is Nazis were the bad guys, they were anti-Catholics, we were victims. 
And if you, if you look at Ratzinger, this is still how he, he explains. And so at Vatican II, it's still ambiguous, the position, also because the German-speaking uh, experts working on this, they are converts. And so they are, 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 are not cradle, or they are biblical experts who make sure that this text has a firm biblical grounding and so on. It, uh, so it's an interesting role that they have. I believe Metz, uh, they open a different page. You, you, you really don't see that during Vatican II. Yeah. So I, I'm Catholic, and on like Good Friday, many for many years, you're following along in the missal, and there's always this giant disclaimer that I don't remember necessarily when I was a kid, but maybe it was there. But how we should think of the Jews, and we're not. It's not the aside, and blah blah blah. Is that all a result of Nostra Aetate? Of course. So here there is an an interesting precedent. So already Pope Pius the 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 twelfth changed something in fifty five. Uh, in the Good Friday prayer for Jews, but if I remember correctly, it's optional. The decisive change is made by Pope John for Good Friday 1959, where with his own pen on the Missal of, uh, of, 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 of uh, St. Peter, he deletes the word perfidis. And so now, Vatican, so after Vatican II, the concept, we pray for those traitor Jews, is no longer there. The question was reopened 12 years ago when Pope Benedict liberalized the access to the pre-Vatican II liturgy. And so he, he gave permission to this group of Catholics who want to celebrate in the Old Mass. And he did that not considering that they would automatically bring back the old prayer of Good Friday for the Jews, which contained the, the, the pro-perfidist Judaeis. And when they found out, in the Vatican, they scrambled, and they made up a new prayer for the Jews of Good Friday, which avoided perfidies, because it, it's a big embarrassment. So yes, that originates from that. Um, and it's one of the things that makes the liturgical reform important. If, if, if you reject the liturgical reform, it means that in some sense you, you reject also Nostra Tate. I mean, even unconsciously. Nostra Tate receives the liturgical reform, and the liturgical reform receives Nostra Tate in, in in the rejection of anti-Jewish, anti anti-Semitic statements. Uh, and so now I have to say there is this movement for, for, for the return of, of the Latin mass. And they no longer have this prayer that is anti-Jewish, but the, the form and the content of the liturgy in in, uh, in Latin is not conciliar that is faithful to Nostetate in the same way the Reformed liturgy is. This is a huge issue for me because it creates, I'm afraid, uh, a generation of Catholics who think that Vatican II is at best indifferent, at worst was a disaster. If you take these things out of the Catholic Church, in one generation you may have big problems. Yep. Um, Massimo, another subject I'm curious about your opinion on in the context of Vatican II being a break from the past, passion plays. How should one think of those? How are they thought of in, in your opinion? You referring to an uh, Oberammergau in a in, in, in Germany, well, so so here Vatican II had a take on these things that was 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 I would say very much influenced by the Enlightenment. Right, so we Catholics we have the Scripture, we have tradition, we don't do stuff. 
Okay, so now with Pope Francis, we do stuff, right? So here, I believe that it's all about how you explain these things. So I believe that, I mean, Wagner's uh, Lieu's in, in Germany, I mean, that kind of folkish Catholicism still echoes a culture that can really be anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic sometimes.